Party will do, and that is why we are opposing this bill. I can hear. Mr. Speaker. Oh. Ah, that's much better. I call the honourable member Jan Logie. Tēnā koe, Mr. Speaker. It's with a degree of suppressed rage that I'm standing now to speak to this first reading. I know I'm holding it back, but it's actually there. Because, and the Green Party will be voting against this bill because we believe all New Zealanders deserve good lives and fair futures. And we know that if we guarantee the essentials, we guarantee the opportunities. Today, I'll focus on the values that have been um, spoken around this bill, particularly in relation to people who are unwell or have disabilities. And my colleague Holly Walker will focus on the impacts for children. For me, people in receipt of income support are not problems to be solved. They are not nameless, shapeless bludges costing our country money or causing their children to live in poverty. I have in front of me today, as I speak to this bill, the faces and the voices of hundreds of people, people who are struggling and stressed and very worried about what is to come. Some of these people are receiving income support and some of them are family members trying to support a loved one who is receiving income support. Talking about beneficiaries as if they don't know what is good for them, as if they need incentivizing to take care of themselves or their children, misses their fundamental humanity. I will not deny that some people's decision making may be impaired due to long term poverty, mental health issues, addictions, violence, or even continual rejection. But that's true whether somebody's in employment or not. I do not see people on income support as fundamentally any different from me. And I'm angry about the hardship they're subjected to now and the likelihood that this bill will make things even worse for them. I'm angry and I'm worried. The government has said they'll be focusing on what people can do, not what they can't, and will be transforming MSD to provide much more support for people to get into employment and thus radically improve their lives. The Minister has accused Auckland Poverty Action in their response to the bill of wanting to leave people stagnating on welfare. She suggests that those who oppose these reforms are patronising and stereotyping people by not believing they can work. She characterises those of us with concerns as wanting to solve problems by throwing money around. She told us that being on a benefit is unhealthy. And today she quoted the evidence from a doctor who showed that every day on a benefit over six months is equal to smoking 200 cigarettes. You know, it's a clever line. And I don't deny they're clever. It positions the government as ambitious, willing to break with tradition and treat people receiving welfare as capable rather than not, needing help rather than punishment. In other words, the government is progressive and they're taking on a major problem in our society. But there are many problems with this. And I'll talk just to seven in this speech. The first problem is they're not treating people as capable. Focusing on capability is critically important. Unfortunately, the government's not doing that. If they thought people were capable, they wouldn't feel the need to incentivize job-seeking behaviors with sanctions. Sanctions are punishments for when people aren't doing something right. The second problem is it individualizes social problems. By focusing on the individual, again, this whole model misses employer biases when it comes to employing people with mental health, physical illnesses, disabilities, or even people who have a name that isn't European. It's incredibly frustrating for me that while this government focuses on creating these incentives for beneficiaries to work, there are thousands of people desperate to work who are being denied these opportunities because the government refuses to recognise the structural inequalities that are locking them out of employment. Recently, I've been working with People First, 
a wonderful self-advocacy organisation for people with learning disabilities, people that we previously probably talked about as people with intellectual disabilities. And they're really worried that the government's going to decide that they're not work capable and leave them languishing without support on the supported living allowance. And I was encouraged to hear that this allowance will encourage people into supported employment, so that may go some way to countering their concerns. However, a lot of, do, most people I don't think realise that over 600 people in this country are earning less than $3 an hour because there's a minimum wage exemption for them. And that requires them to stay on a benefit and go to these appointments and work. There are fundamental injustices here. I've also spoken to many people within the disability sector about the discrimination they're facing in gaining employment. And I'd like now to share a story from Alison Hamlet, who's the chair of the CCS Disability Action LAC in Auckland. And to quote her, and this is a long quote, so try and hang in there. I've spent about 15 years working on a not-for-profit governance boards, starting when I was 17 years old at the Cerebral Palsy Society. My father commented once that all the work I do means the government's getting my services really cheaply. The current government policies, however, make me feel incredibly guilty that I've, not been, that I've been unable to turn my contribution to society into something that can support me financially. I feel guilty because I know that I have enough intellect and function to get paid work, but employers look at the way I walk and talk, then freak. They need to see me at the LAC board table. They need to see me having meetings with the regional manager. They need to see the ideas that are generated by the Auckland LAC. They need to see me in the other advocacy roles that take up my time. This bill does nothing to get Alison paid employment. It reinforces her sense of guilt at the sense that she has the problem when it's our society that has the problem. The third problem with this bill is that there are many people who may not be in a place to work. And I've suffered from depression, and I know how bleak the world can seem from that place, and how even the smallest demands can seem impossible and reinforce existing feelings of inadequacy. The government's new policy to me sounds like the legislative version of pull your socks up approach to depression. This has never worked and it won't work because even with the fancy new language, fun depression is fundamentally different from laziness. Of course it helps in recovery to have people supporting you, encouraging you to do things like get up and go outside. But a government institution cannot be that person. They've got too much of a conflict of interest, especially in a wider cost-saving culture. Also, being that supportive person does mean that you need to recognise that the healing process is not linear. Sometimes it will be okay not to get out of bed. It will be okay not to go to work, and that's an important part in the process of recovery. The fourth problem with this bill is that it's based on a model that's not worked in other places. This model in the UK has resulted in an increasing number of suicides of people with illnesses and disabilities. The fifth problem with this bill is it takes people's away people's control of their own health. To require people who are sick to engage in work readiness activities and look for work assumes they don't know what's best for them. It assumes they wouldn't do that when they were ready. It even seems to assume their doctor doesn't know either. This legislation will require people diagnosed with cancer to focus on what they're capable of in terms of employment, rather than what they're not. Now, this will change once they've been diagnosed as terminal, admittedly. But if they want to keep working or to look for work, then great. I'm not against that. But surely, in a reasonable society, we'd let somebody battling cancer focus on that battle, not siphon off their energies into proving their work readiness or availability. Sixth problem with this bill is that not all work is better for you. Despite the evidence that was quoted, there's plenty of other evidence that says the contrary. And to quote just one section of research that says, these findings underscore the importance to a person's well-being. Rather than seeking any job, 
The study suggests people who are unemployed should seek positions that offer more security, autonomy and reasonable workload. This legislation proposes a 13-week stand-down loss of income for anyone who turns down what work and income defines as suitable but does not, has no allowance for security, autonomy and workload. This will have negative health consequences. I call the honourable member.